started farming at age 14, 15. Did that for a while and then I was 20, I left Holland and um, traveled the world for 12 years, mostly in third world countries. There I got in close contact with small family farms, like two acres, three acres, one acre. And people who live off that, that's all they got. People uh, have time for each other and the children are around and the grandchildren are around and it feels really, really wholesome. I came here after my last six years I spent in India, in rural India. and. Uh, so I, I right away looked at that to do small farming and try to continue the lifestyle I've been used to living. And I'm 60 years old now and I kind of managed to do that, to do that, hold on to that uh, undeveloped world philosophy. It's a, just a, a miracle journey, I, I love it still. I know so many people in Santa Cruz who I sell food to for almost 30 years. That's the end of the route, I go to the market with my truck and meet the customers who I feed. I like the whole thing, I can't really pick out a detail, you know, I love planting the crops, you know, it's such a high to be planting, especially in the, in the spring, when you've been stacking it a little bit, and you start off again, and you put the seed in the ground, and you put the water on it, and it's, it all starts with water, I guess. Right? Yeah, there's not much you can do without water, and, and some people think you can dry farm, because some tomato varieties you can dry farm, which is true, but, but most crops you need regular water on a regular basis, it's, it's hard to get around that. When I moved here seven years ago and I was really happy to find this land and exactly for what I like to grow uh, had the perfect conditions and by June the first year the first week of June all my strawberry plants 25,000 of them which is nothing but for me it's a lot it's an acre and a half uh, they were all dead all brown and dead and um, I didn't spot any diseases and uh, I was kind of mesmerized I couldn't figure out what went wrong that year and um, I finally took some water sample and went to the laboratorium with the water sample and found out there was too much sodium in the water. They all died, every single one. And um, this is my story, but then if you see the map of salination of the wells here, it's, I think it's crossing the highway right now. I'm on the uh, banks of the San Lorenzo River, and we haven't had significant rain since December of 2012, more than 13 months ago. In years of drought like this, we are in a perilous situation. Water for Santa Cruz was a nine-minute film that wondered why are we looking to build a desalination plant when we live in the edge of a redwood rainforest. There were a lot of other people who shared the sentiment that we could find another way. Mayor Bryant, and city manager Martine Bernal said, we're gonna put a pause in the desal plant. We'll reset because obviously we have a disconnect. While I'm gratified that the desalination plant has been put on hold, we still need to solve the water supply problem. According to the water department, we need 900 million gallons a year of additional water supply. Well, the desal plant has been put on hold and we still need 900 million gallons. We found the 900 million gallons here in Santa Cruz County. And it's water that is sustainable. It's water that can be obtained in an incremental basis. And it's water that can be obtained economically and we're going to show you how that's done. We produced this introduction at the beginning of the year. Our opinions and beliefs have shifted as we have seen and heard from people who live and breathe this issue. Santa Cruz is in the third year of a drought, but the citizens have responded by exceeding the goals set by the water departments. Water use this summer has been reduced almost 30 percent. The Water Supply Advisory Committee received over 100 ideas, and many of the best ones came from water district employees writing submittals under their own names. We are moving in the right direction, but to get where we need to go, we need to begin by understanding where our water comes from. The city of Santa Cruz is unique among the areas that supply water around Monterey Bay in that their primary water supply is surface water. There's a small amount of groundwater that is pumped from a coastal aquifer on the east side of Santa Cruz but a lot of that water actually originates in the San Lorenzo River. Our watershed is 108 square miles. It consists of the San Lorenzo River, which itself is 25 miles long, and its tributaries, Newell Creek, Fall Creek, Zianti Creek, Bean Creek, Carbonero Creek, 
and about 15 other small streams. Those tributaries all flow into the San Lorenzo near Felton and that is the surface water which is the main water supply for Santa Cruz and its customers. The whole watershed uh, produces about uh, 95,000 acre feet a year so the, the water usage is about 15 to 16 percent of the what's flowing out of the river. The San Lorenzo watershed is a redwood forest. By 1900 this watershed had been logged. It was almost bare. Since then, second growth forest has slowly revived. Now the forest is thriving and increases its water holding capacity every year. It is this watershed which supplies the San Lorenzo with what we call surface water. Even though this is a third consecutive year of drought and it hasn't rained in six months, the San Lorenzo watershed continues to flow out of the hillsides into the creeks. Here is Zianti Creek on October the 15th. This is our water supply, but that's only half the equation. The other half is our water distribution system. Making the water come out of people's faucet is the measure of success. Thinking not just about in the moment and where we are and what we have to do to make the service happen today, but planning and thinking about the, how do we manage for the future. Our water is collected from the San Lorenzo River and sent to the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant, where it is cleaned and filtered and made ready for consumption. Water that is used inside our homes and businesses is then collected in the sanitary sewer system and sent to the wastewater treatment plant at Neary Lagoon. Well, our function with the wastewater plant is really to treat and release the water safely. Pretty much we stick to a natural process here. It's just like what a river would do through algae on a rock. As organic material gently flows over the algae, the algae wants to stay alive. It's gonna consume that organic matter and it's gonna take the harmful bacteria out of it. And this truly is a natural process down here. It's just in a real controlled, sped up environment. This is a, a high functioning plant. In fact, it just was awarded best in the state for this size of plant. The Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant was built in 1960. The life of a water treatment plant is 50 years and we are past that already. We're beginning to make some major reinvestments in this water treatment plant that you see behind me here and I think that there are some things about our sources of supply that are shifting around so that we can make wise use of the funds we're going to reinvest in this plant. Those kinds of things are priority short term. As we rebuild the system, we can improve it to harvest excess winter flows on the San Lorenzo River. We pull water out of the San Lorenzo River until it gets dirty. And then when it gets dirty, we have to rely on the lake. And there's only one pipeline, so water can only flow you know, either to us or from us. So every time it rains and the water's dirty, we lose the capacity to pump up to the lake. If we were to increase our capacity of solids here at the treatment plant, I could bring water in from Felton Diversion, pump it up to the lake, and bring it to the dam at the same time. Subsurface diversion devices like Randy collectors would be used to filter out the the, the murkiness, the greediness from the water right off the bat because the water would be filtered by the stream beds on its way to this shallow well essentially. And so clean water would be taken right there and put in the lock. Our ability to capture the excess winter flows in the San Lorenzo River could be wonderful. But this brings up a larger issue that Santa Cruz must deal with in order to achieve water security. One of the challenges here is that the storage is not adequate to get us through multiple dry years in a row. We get all of our rain during the relatively short winters and then have long dry summers. We don't have enough storage right now to tide us through drought periods. We can't take any more water out of the streams during the summer. They're already oversubscribed, but there's plenty of water available during the winter time. So if we take that water out, both to reduce groundwater pumping and to capture water and actually put it back into the ground to increase groundwater storage, then we've, we've uh, addressed that issue of increasing our storage. Several abandoned quarries exist in Santa Cruz County. All of these quarries could hold water collected in the rainy season to be processed and distributed in the dry seasons. Joe Ben Benvert, the owner of Lydell Springs Quarry, has offered to line his quarry and build a dam. The resultant reservoir could hold over two billion gallons of water. 
almost the capacity of the Loch Lomond Reservoir. From a hydrologic perspective, it makes a lot of sense. If you have flows in the wintertime that are very high flows, and you were to divert a small fraction of that, it would have no negative environmental impact and then could be available for other uses. The areas around Santa Cruz rely heavily on groundwater, and many of those aquifers have space where additional water could be stored. The idea of water transfers requires three elements. Harvesting available winter flows in the San Lorenzo, storing that water in a reservoir, a quarry, or an aquifer, and moving that water during the dry season for treatment and distribution. All of those elements are within our control, but it is going to take the cooperation of the entire region to make sure that the water gets where it needs to go. The San Lorenzo River watershed includes lots of communities, not just, you know, the city of Santa Cruz. So if we're going to take care of our watershed in order to safeguard our water supply, that involves collaboration with the other communities that are in this watershed with us. The excess winter flows in the San Lorenzo River will solve our water issues in the short term and the medium term. In the long term, we want to explore other possibilities. Working with the Water Department and Soquel Creek, we've applied for a grant to look at the feasibility of using um, recycled water in the county wide. I am a big proponent of Reclaim Water. The state has provided health and safety standards which permit the use of recycled water to include a replenishment of rivers, aquifers, ground basins, and reservoirs, in addition to permitted irrigation uh, uses such as golf courses. Pasa Tiempo Golf Course is a gem in the Santa Cruz foothills. It was created by Marion Hollins, a Santa Cruz resident. She commissioned Alastair McKenzie, the man who built Augusta National Golf Course. Of all the golf courses Dr. McKenzie built, Pasa Tiempo was his favorite. It's been something that Pasa Tiempo has been working towards for over 10 years. The last three superintendents, the last three general managers have all been trying to get some type of recycled water here. My previous in employment at the Olympic Club in San Francisco, um, we were on tertiary water. Agronomically, there's some changes that you have to make, but those adjustments can be made and, and managed well. You know, the, the infrastructure is in the ground for the most part. And so it's really just uh, coming down to being able to negotiate long-term contract, which is what we're looking for at Pasa Tiempo, um, to receive that from the city of Scotts Valley. Scotts Valley built a water reclamation plant 10 years ago. The city can only use some of the reclaimed water. The rest of the reclaimed water flows in a pipe right past the Pasa Tiempo golf course on its way to disposal in the Monterey Bay. Reclaimed water for Pasa Tiempo is just the beginning. Santa Cruz has 3 billion gallons of recycled water at the Neri Lagoon. Less than 100 million gallons of that are reused. This water could be treated and sent to the north coast to water Brussels sprouts or towards Watsonville to be made available to farmers. Some people are wary of this resource. We went and spoke to Ron Dunkervoort at Windmill Farms about his experience using reclaimed water on his organic farm for the last seven years. I'm lucky enough that I have the, the irrigation from Pajaro Valley recycled water coming through my farm here so I could hook up to them and I'm getting recycled water from, from Pajaro Valley. I open the valve and it's always there and it's clean and it's wonderful. It's, it's the way of the future, I think. And I can say so because I'm doing it. I'm not dreaming about that aspect. I'm actually getting it. It's not cheap, but it's, 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 uh, it's water. You pay for that, you know. They farm a little property across the street here and I think it's probably more expensive than the recycled water at the end. I would have to leave if there was no recycled water on this property. I had to go and look for a new property and probably farther away from the coast because it is all getting salinated more and more. And uh, so thanks to the recycled water I can be here and grow great food. The hydrologic cycle has been understood for a long time. It is an old concept. The word hydrologic comes from Latin and Greek. In Latin, hydro means water, and in Greek, logos means reason. It's certainly true that uh, water is in motion throughout the hydrologic cycle, and it has been for billions of years. Uh, so water that we see now in the ocean, at some point in the past, it might have been on the top of a mountain. And water that we see in streams now, at some point in the past, might have been in, in an aquifer. Um, I think what we're learning 
is that there are benefits to the way the hydrologic cycle operates. People are finding it easier to see and measure and recognize those benefits. The challenge is getting those benefits included in the cost-benefit analysis that people do when they look at various water alternatives. One of the challenges with working with natural systems is they're less predictable than engineered systems. So when you have water behind a dam, as long as there's water there, you can generate the flow at the rate you like. If you're running a desal system, you flip the switch, you turn the knob, you get the water you want. There's a certain appeal to that from an engineering perspective because it can be controlled. When we deal with natural systems or quasi-natural systems like, like aquifers and rivers that have been influenced by people, we have less control. And developing infrastructure that can handle that, that can supply enough water, even though we can't control it quite as well, that's the challenge. But the benefit is that we get the hydrologic system services that those aquatic systems provide. And so this is really the tension right now. We're seeing the benefit of keeping these systems operating, of at least partly restoring them to the way they operated before people got involved. That provides a benefit, but it comes at a cost. It might make our water supply a little less reliable, or it might require that we have more people involved in the management, which is a little more complicated. We can look at how the system used to work, and we can recognize that moving towards that direction can be beneficial. And the trick then is to find the places where you can do that at minimal cost and minimal negative impact and find the most benefit for as many different people and ecological systems as possible. And we don't need to find all of the places, we just need to find a few. That's not gonna solve all of the water problems, but it's gonna be part of a series of solutions that move us in the right direction.